Father God in heaven, we come before you today understanding that when we talk about faith, we talk about faith in your son, Jesus Christ, and who he is as the Messiah. I pray that as we spend time remembering him today, you would grant us your grace to remember him rightly, to see him as you describe him in your word. Lord God, that you would be glorified and you would be pleased, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, for our time around the Lord's table today, we're going to be looking at a passage in which Jesus proves to the world that he is the Messiah. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15? We're going to be looking at verses 29 to 32. If you don't have a Bible, some men are going to be coming down the aisles. Simply raise your hand and they will get a Bible to you. And if you don't actually own a Bible, consider this our gift to you so that you can be reading God's Word for yourself. In our passage today, the setting is that Jesus is already on the cross. He's on the cross, and he has already been tried and convicted by a godless Roman ruler, and he has been beaten mercilessly by Roman soldiers. Uh, He's weak and helpless, even more so than the other two men who are there being crucified with him. As we look at our passage today, I want us to observe two things about our passage. The first is the three groups of people who are mentioned in the passage, and the second thing we want to look at is the disposition that those people have towards Jesus. So let's read verses 29 to 32 together. Those passing were hurling abuse at him, at Jesus, wagging their heads and saying, ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let this Christ, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. So in verse 29, we see the general public mocking Jesus. These are the same people who were present at Jesus' trial the night before, and they gave false testimony about Jesus. And what they did was they distorted Jesus' prophecy about himself, that he would resurrect himself from the dead in three days. They distorted that message into a claim that Jesus would actually physically destroy the temple. They knew that nobody survived a Roman crucifixion, and mockingly they were saying to Jesus, how can you be who you say you are? How can you destroy the temple if you can't even get down from this cross and save yourself? The chief priests are there in verse 31, along with the scribes, and they've been mocking Jesus since the night before when they conducted his mock trial. They have no belief whatsoever in Jesus as the Messiah. And what they're saying to Jesus is, you possibly, you can't possibly be the Messiah. The reason why you can't be the Messiah is because you're still on the cross. How can you be the Messiah who saves other people if you can't even save yourself? And then finally, there are the two men who are crucified along with Jesus. And at this point in their crucifixion, their disdain for Jesus is so great that even in the midst of their own suffering, they find it within themselves to insult Jesus. What these three groups of people were blind to is the same thing that every unbeliever is blind to today. And that is the message that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And that he proved that by remaining on the cross, by actually staying on the cross and completing the work that God had for him to do. That he could accomplish something on the cross that no other human being could accomplish on the cross. And what he accomplished in those six hours on the cross was the purchase of salvation. Jesus actually saved while he was on the cross. And it was a very specific group of people whom Jesus saved. He saved every person who has the opposite understanding of the understanding that was had by the people in our passage this morning. He saved those who believe that their sin separates them from a holy God, and that because of their sin, they deserve to experience God's wrath forever in a place called hell. And that's the penalty for their sin. They understand that God has a penalty for sin. And it's an unbearable, excruciating, endless penalty. that goes on forever and ever and ever. 
because they as a person are attempting to appease and soothe and satisfy the wrath of a holy God, an infinitely holy, infinitely powerful, infinitely existing God. That's not the only thing they understand, though. They understand one other thing that's very important this morning. They understand that Jesus really is the Messiah. The person who believes in Jesus Christ understands that what they believe in is that he is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the one who hung on a cross. And when he hung on that cross, he received God's judgment within his own body against everybody who had placed their trust in him. So if you understand Jesus that way this morning, we invite you, we ask you, we welcome you to enjoy and experience and partake in, in the Lord's table with us today. When the elements come to you, take them and hold them and consider what Christ did when he was on the cross in those six hours. Consider the experience that he had, that in that six hours, he was absorbing within his own body the same wrath that we deserve to experience forever in a place called hell. And after you've prepared your heart, take the elements on your own when you're ready. But if you're here today and, and Jesus Christ is not your savior, he's not your Lord, you don't submit to him as master and Lord, you need to understand something that's very, very important. What you need to understand is that your understanding of Jesus is really no different than the understanding that these people had in this passage. They doubt that Jesus was the one who saves. They doubt that the Jesus is the one who is able to take those who don't believe and make them able to believe and to save them and purchase a salvation for them that's eternal and that's perfect and that's permanent. This is the message of the gospel, that God saves sinners. It's the message that everybody who is in this room believed at one point in their unbelief that they must embrace Christ. They cry out to Christ and they ask him to save them. And because he died on the cross for everyone who would believe in him, he did save. So this is an excellent opportunity for those of us who believe to partake. If you're not a believer, when the elements come to you, simply pass the elements by and consider the claims of Jesus. I invite you to keep reading this passage and you'll see that Jesus did indeed stay on the cross for six hours. He stayed on that cross for the entirety of that six hours to purchase salvation for everybody who would believe. I'll be available after the service, so will any other elders or the people in the row next to you. Any of us would be happy to talk with you about what it looks like to place your trust in Jesus and walk with Jesus as your Savior for the rest of your life into eternity. So men, come and serve us when everybody has partaken. I'll pray together for us.